The last couple of years, um, I've worked on distributed teams at a couple of different companies. And we'll do the obligatory second, though I guess in this de deck it's the fourth slide. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, if you're not super familiar with US geography, it's in the middle and uh, by the big lakes. I work for Pivotal. I do tech advocacy for Cloud Foundry. We can talk about that more at the reception later. This talk isn't really about that. Uh, I podcast with Arrested DevOps. And uh, I'm also the head organizer for DevOps Days. So I don't think we've had a DevOps Days Copenhagen. So come find me, talk to me about that. Maybe we can make that happen. So I've, I've spent a great deal of time. I spent from 1999 until last August on call for production infrastructure. It, by the way, it turns out that when you go into a tech advocacy job, you don't actually get more sleep. Like that part was a lie. Um, because instead of PagerDuty waking you up, it's the Fly Delta app. But um, I still work on a distributed team. And the fact that, and I, I had to put it in kilometers for this audience. I'm an ignorant American, so I'm really not sure how much that is. But Google Maps said it would take like, you know, 600 hours to walk it, so. And uh, our whole team actually lives in various places in the US and one person on the team in South Korea. Uh, I actually have a team member here. Shout out to Kenny Bastani, sitting in the front row. Um, but uh, the, I think of all the people on the team, Kenny's probably the one who lives the closest to the San Francisco and Palo Alto. You're probably equidistant between headquarters in Palo Alto and uh, the San Francisco office. I don't know, how much time do you actually spend in the offices? Zero. Yeah, he says zero. Because our entire team is distributed, which means we spend all our time doing that communication stuff, you know, mostly via the internet, unless we're at conferences together. And this. You're thinking, okay, maybe that works for like, you know, traveling tech advocate types, but does that actually work for, you know, devs and ops and all of that? And it's like, well, I mean, yes, I think so, but I want to clarify that when I talk about distributed teams here, I don't actually mean one person, you know, remote away from the rest of the team. Uh, because the problem with that is one person or a scattered amount of people that are really far away from where the, you know, the center of gravity is and all the hallway discussions and the offline decision making happens, ends up being really isolated. So that's something to watch out for. If, you're if you think you want to build a distributed organization, watch out for what happens when you decide to just like tack some remote people on to an organization that isn't really built for that. Like, I think you have to think about you know, building your team mindfully or your whole organization, but whatever your unit of you know, scope is, Think about building that um, to be uh, remote first, as opposed to just putting people really far away from everybody else. Um, and then, like, just logistics, where I actually work is I do have a co-working space membership. It's in a, you know, in a really nice ancient building in Minneapolis, ancient by, you know, U.S. standards, so it's like 120, 130 years old. Um, but uh, mostly the, go, you know, favorite coffee shop, GoGo in-flight Wi-Fi, which is terrible, um, is where I do most of my work if I'm not, you know, at an actual conference. But I still, I feel like we still have that um, DevOps, you know, like thinking about the divisions between teams, you can still have that whether or not the teams are co-located, right? Like, so, I mean, how many people are familiar with this, like, you know, like DevOps wall of confusion? Like the, this classic wall of confusion um, is from uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer some years back. I like to think of it a little bit more like, hey, development, throw code over the wall to operations. Oh no, operations has to now like, live with the, the consequences of the results. If you have those sort of divisions inside your organization, and they're exacerbated by those team members like never actually interacting with one another, possibly if you have your ops people in, you know, I don't know, offshore or your dev people offshore or whatever, like you can get a lot of these classic conflicts that we talk about in a DevOps uh, context um, in a team that has, you know, a lot of remote distributed members. So I think that like when we talk about this stuff in DevOps, I think probably the, there's always more depth to it than that like simple brick wall, right? Because it's not as simple as saying, oh, I'm just going to learn everyone else's job too. It's like, okay, full stack, is that real? I mean, no, I don't think so. So like, you don't actually have time for that. And the part where 
You would like to put all the devs on call. That sounds great in theory. And maybe if you have a whole bunch of microservices and you have your monitoring set up such that you can correctly and you know, consistently alert just on the problems with that one microservice and just send it to the dev team responsible for deploying those problems into production, like, yeah, it's maybe possible, but underlying all of the microservices, you probably have some sort of infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or whether it's your AWS account that you did who knows what to the VPC. And then like some dev team gets paged because it, there's something wrong with their microservice, but what's really wrong is a configuration in the VPC. You start to see how it's not as simple as saying, oh, well, well I'll just get along. It's like, well, I mean, you need a little bit more, for example, in your monitoring and alerting, you need a little bit more context for people to you know, get alerted on the right things, the actionable things, and things they can do something about, and also have it be the stuff that's actually within their sphere of influence. Um, we should also, like, because in the DevOps context, we always talk about empathy, I try to think of it as, like, I spent a long time in ops feeling like I was the villain of the piece, and I gotta tell you, when I saw this bunny in our garden, I was pretty much like, kill, you know? It's like, you, you think of, um, you think of the, the person or, you know, little you know, creepy crawly critter that's causing you so much trouble as being the one who you just stop them from deploying some bad code or you just stop them from deciding to make a whole bunch of changes and like, why didn't they put an index on that query? But it's not really a them thing because like, okay, seriously, from this bunny's perspective, it looks like he was actually trying to get out of the fenced garden. Like he got in somehow because there was delightful, delectable, delicious stuff in there but he couldn't really figure out how to get out. And it's like when I thought about it from his perspective, I was like, oh, he's actually trying to figure out how to get out. That's actually terrible. And I think about like, okay, the, the dev who deploys, you know, or you know, checks in anyway some code that ends up causing terrible, terrible problems. Is it really their fault? Well, I mean, obviously you have some kind of code review. There's also a lot of architectural decisions that went into making something that you could take down with like a single deploy. So it's like, hmm, maybe we need to think about that a little bit more, you know, blue, green, et cetera. Um, I also think that especially on very distributed teams, like setting the expectations for what you want people on the team to do are pretty useful. Like it's really hard for people to intuitively tell or guess that someone on the team is unhappy. Uh, I mean, you can obviously have all the back channels you want on Slack or whatever else, but like, if people aren't talking to each other, how do you tell if they're unhappy? Um, so like being more explicit about your communication than perhaps you otherwise would be. You know, like I think just uh, the other day, um, Schaefer, our boss, uh, said on Slack, I think we need to have a team meeting. What time zones are good for people? And it's probably gonna take us a couple of days through Slack to figure out, you know, for everyone to get to a, okay, this is what, you know, we'll converge on what actually works. But I feel like putting that expectation out there is pretty valuable. Um, there's also something to say about uh, nonviolent communication and like emotional literacy, which are, I have, by the way, I have a page of notes at the end with a lot of references. You can go read a lot of this stuff. I think it was John Alspaugh was tweeting about this nonviolent communication thing. And I remember thinking like, you know, I think, I forget if it was he said something directly to me or in a reply in a conversation, but I remember thinking like nonviolent communication, I mean, do I need that? And then later, I'm, you know, I'm mad about something and I'm thinking, stabity, stabity, stabity. Yeah, it's like, okay, probably. I, need, I, I probably need nonviolent communication. Um, but how this actually works, uh, if, you, if you go read about nonviolent communication, uh, it's, it's not as, um, I don't know, touchy-feely as it sounds. It's actually exactly what we're used to dealing with in our systems, which is to say, <sighs> Instead of using a UDP style, just spray a bunch of information out there and then hope everyone got it, uh, you use a handshake and say, what I think I heard you say was that you really don't want to do the deploy on Friday because you don't feel comfortable with it. Is that right? And then they repeat back like, actually, yeah, I feel like this is kind of a disaster and we haven't thought this through. So stuff like that, like instead of listening to something, and then waiting for your turn to talk, because that's what a lot of us do when we're listening to people. Listening to something and then repeating back to them what you think you heard is a really good way to make sure that you actually are on the same page. And even more valuable, obviously, when you're doing a lot of lower bandwidth communication, like, um, you know, obviously email, which you should never do because it's terrible, or chat, 
or um, you know, Hangouts or whatever are not going to be as high bandwidth as in person. So something else, uh, you know, another AllSpot thing, he, was, he likes to email people PDFs, but he also um, tweeted this particular one. And uh, if, you, if you haven't read this, it's actually really interesting, the Common Ground paper. Uh, Woods et al. wrote this paper, and um, I suppose, you know, I'm sure somebody has done this one at a Papers We Love meetup. Uh, but you know, what do you think, Camille? Are you going to do this one at a Papers We Love? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea here is that at one point, you and your teammates understood where you both were, you were on the same page, you agreed with each other, and possibly, say, when you were designing those endpoints or deciding exactly which you know, distributed data store you were going to use for something versus which one they were going to use. And then at some point, you stopped syncing your communications just enough that later you're like, why does this, why does this endpoint return 200 OK no matter what? I feel like this is really bad if we're going to be using that to decide whether or not to bounce stuff out of the load balancer. Oh, I didn't understand that you were actually using that health check for something. I mean, we have CloudWatch for that, right? And you're like, no, it's for something else. So like that idea of whether or not you think you're on the same page, just continuing to communicate is just continuing to surface information for the rest of the people on the team helps a lot, especially, again, when you're in the lower bandwidth communication. Otherwise, you end up with coordination surprise, which is nowhere near as like, awesome or exciting as it sounds, usually leads to outages. Um, and so then you're, you're thinking, like, OK, wait, are you saying that like, this is all documentation? You have to just write everything down? OK, so I, I'm actually not a huge fan of documentation. And the reason is because it usually ends up in wikis where you can't find it. And um, it's also always wrong. And that's because everything is changing all the time, right? And so like, you can have a plan of how things are supposed to work. But by the time, I mean, how many times do you think to yourself, OK, I've, I've done the hotfix, and I've updated the documentation you know, under pressure, when on call, whatever. It's like, no, that's probably not going to happen. So like, instead, I'm a, a bigger fan of the really explicit, clear commit messages. Because I feel like at that moment when you commit the code is when you have the most context, and you know why you did it. And also, like, don't just write what you did. Be like, change the value of you know, whatever. And you know, change that particular load balancer. And you're like, that's great. I can see that that's what you did, past self. Why? Why did you do it? So like, while you have that answer, is the right time to write that down. Um, this, by the way, I'm really excited about. Uh, my, my spouse, Joe, and I are going to go over to the Vasa Museet in Stockholm uh, later in the week. And uh, I have seen it before, but I'm really excited to see it again because, you know, this is the, uh, the lightning talk you should all go, all go watch is Pete Cheslock's uh, 17th century shipbuilding and your failed software project from uh, Monitorama in 2014. It's hilarious stuff. Um, OK, so like another thing about writing stuff down. Like, I feel like just writing down that there's a problem isn't necessarily good enough. And you probably can't read that sign, so I'll blow it up. And I remember thinking, this is in um, Orlando, in the Walt Disney Park. And I remember thinking, OK, this is disturbing on so many levels, because there are a lot of small children walking around here, and you know, just tourists walking around. And there's no fence, and presumably no animal control of any sort. Like, there's just kind of a warning. There's snakes and alligators in this beautiful water here. Don't be near it, even though I'm not standing. Like, I'm standing, when I take this picture, I'm standing on the sidewalk at a very reasonable distance. And I'm thinking, like, there's so many places that we feel like we wrote down, you know, OK, we marked, well, I marked that ticket, won't fix. It's like, yeah, but it's still a problem, maybe. I mean, somebody wrote it down for a reason. And so just writing down, like, that you're not going to deal with it, I don't think is enough of an answer. I mean, at least say why, right? I feel like the, the a really rough thing you can do to somebody who's done the courtesy of like giving you, even in an open source project, even not inside your entire organization, if somebody has given you like the gift of their time to tell you a perceived problem, just to say, like, we're not going to fix this. It's like, uh, that is not a great way to communicate. Um, one way that I really like to communicate, uh, my coworker, Kenny and I uh, have a coworker, Casey West, who wrote a really good blog post. And he was talking about like, the benefits of if you have a distributed team that you do everything in durable communication. 
And I think that's really valuable if you think of it as, instead of the ephemeral, you know, let's, what is it with people who want to hop on a call? Like, I never want to hop on a call, ever. But when people want to hop on a call or they want to have a hangout, like, that's a good way to have higher bandwidth, you know, discussions. But unless you actually write down the results of that, it didn't happen, right? Like Google Doc or that meeting didn't happen because even in-person meetings, because if you think about it, how many meetings have you gone to, whether it's you know, a video chat or a meeting in person, where you leave the meeting and someone else leaves the meeting and later there's coordination surprise because you clearly didn't actually agree on the results of that meeting even though you were both there. You're like, how does this happen? Well, we all experience life through our own perceptual filters. So it's like it's actually really important to make sure you keep some sort of record that you can at least refer back to, if only to win arguments, right? Um, something else that I think about a lot, actually, is, well, cap theorem, because distributed systems. But uh, Eric Brewer went back about 12 years later and wrote an article, I think, for InfoQ, um, about you know revisiting cap theorem. And he talked about partitions being a time bound on communication. The idea being like, say you have a partition, okay, that's cool. Do you wait until the heat death of the universe? Like, probably not. So you're going to wait some amount of time before you decide, yeah, we're probably gonna stay in split brain for a while here, we need to cope with this. So I was thinking about this and I was like, wait a minute, in our, in our human interactions, we actually have a lot of this too, right? Like, we have a lot of this. I was in Bangalore this last spring and uh, I was at the Target Agile Dojo there, and they have these clocks on the wall because Target is headquartered in Minneapolis. And I remember thinking, yeah, they are not gonna wait 10 and a half hours for Minneapolis to wake up to make a decision every day, right? So the, the, uh, the idea of having a team that's distributed everywhere needs to go along with the ability to distribute the decision-making as far as possible to the edges. Because that way, you know, if you're here, you're not going to wait for California to wake up to make a decision. And if you're, you know, in Bangalore, likewise. And putting people in, um, it, putting people in teams without the ability to do localized uh, decision making basically just says, hey, we're offshoring some stuff to you, but you're not actually autonomous. And I feel like we've spend a lot of time thinking about this in, dis in our distributed systems, where we don't want to lock and wait forever. It's like, mm, no, let's decentralize that so that we can keep moving and provide, like, you know, a partial answer. I mean, even if our, uh, you know, distributed systems, which our collections of microservices definitely are going to be, are going to be in a state of continuous partial failure at all times, we at least want to be at least semi-effective in some parts of it. And I feel like that's really applicable to distributed teams, too, which does mean yeah, the people at the, you know, at the top of the, the pyramid can't have all the decision-making flowing up to them. Um, this is, it was actually kind of funny that Sam mentioned this in his opening talk this morning because I've had this slide in the stack for ages. And uh, what I like about this is, and Adrian Cockroft, by the way, kind of called out to this at a conference, I think it was like earlier this year or late last year, where he mentioned that, yeah, but... A monolith has complexity too. It's just hidden from you. And that's totally true. But you still might not know where all the complexity in your microservices are either. I think that, what, especially when you're trying to do um, any kind of auto healing or any kind of um, auto scaling, like, hmm, you're not going to auto scale your way out of a database problem. Like, there's going to be back pressure somewhere. So there's, there's a lot of places where you're going to have to try to solve for which part of your complex system made up of microservices is actually causing your problems. There's, there's actually a lot, of, um, there's a lot of interesting work going on in this space right now. Uh, I saw Jason Dixon tweeting that there's gonna be another Monitorama EU like, you know, in the next year. So I guess watch Monitorama and see when that's gonna happen. But there's also, um, I know there was a talk earlier at this conference about Humio and uh, Charity Majors and some other folks have Honeycomb going on too for, this is that like uh, looking at all of the logs, all of the context and trying to get um, some answers before you just start, I don't know, scale up everything, see if that makes it better. It's like actually that might make it worse sometimes depending on what's going wrong. Um, something else that I think like in our 
both distributed systems and teams that I think is important to consider is what I was just referencing, the state of continuous partial failure. Like, we all know people, maybe for a friend, you can acknowledge that you've worked with people that uh, they architect things for if everything will go well. And you're like, that, that'll be super if everything goes well. Um, if everything doesn't go well, I mean, you're going to get paged in the middle of the night and there's going to be sadness. And you're going to wonder exactly how many services you're actually crammed into that microservice. Like, by the way, I, I think everybody probably, just like DevOps, everybody has their own definition of microservices. Mine is this. If you can't have an endpoint that can answer, is this working, yes or no, uh, there, there's too many things in that service. Because if the answer is, well... It's like, no, that's not a microservice. Um, but if you're, if you're thinking about the kind of failures that are going to happen in our distributed systems and also in our distributed teams, like having some amount of redundancy is great. And you're like, OK, that's cool. I mean, I can have an autoscaling group, but I can't have an autoscaling group of humans. I mean, they're not completely fungible resources, even if some HR departments would like to believe they are. Like, they're not. So I, I would say, like, Having the ability to have members of the team back each other up. Um, I know that, uh, like, you know, Kenny and Casey have done a whole bunch of roadshow stuff, and I think they can, you know, and, and our coworker Fred, and I think they can all do each other's talks by this point. Is that right, Kenny? Yeah, Kenny's nodding from the front row. So that's kind of, if you have, um, you know, like some plan for when some person becomes unavailable. Uh, because, you know, sometimes people just want to go canoeing, like, where there's no cell signal. Like, those things do happen. And uh, you have to have a plan for that. And on the, on the topic, by the way, just, just because uh, two pizza teams are a super popular trope, I don't know about if they're as popular in Europe. I know in the U.S. they're super popular with, when you talk about uh, microservices. This idea of you have, like, this cross-functional team and, like, every single skill set possible, and they're all working together in this little pod, and they just work on this one service, and I guess you hire, like, N of those teams if you have N microservices. Doesn't Uber have, like, 6,000 microservices? I kind of wonder, like, how many microservices per team? But then I start wondering, like, you know, how hungry are these teams, and how big are these pizzas? I feel like there's, there's a lot of dividing people up into groups that then don't need to talk to each other because they have everything they need inside their group that is kind of, I don't know, kind of reductionist. Like, just because, for example, just because you have um, all the, everyone inside your little team that, you know, runs and operates your microservice, you know, from soup to nuts, end to end, um, is all together, whether they're all together virtually in the same Slack channel or whatever, um, that doesn't mean that they're not going to need to talk to other teams. And I think that there's, I sort of see, like, there was even a recent discussion on Twitter about, like, oh, you probably don't need to have the ability to have teams, like, communicate because you have everything communicating through APIs. And I'm like, eh, I so fundamentally disagree with that. Mostly because I look at Conway's law. And I think, like, okay, so if we're going to design systems that are going to, perforce, look like our organizations, um, like, I just got a recruiter spam. I tweeted about it because it was kind of distressing. I should put that tweet in the stack. Where they said that they have two different uh, implementations of OpenStack at their organization that they're running in production. And I remember thinking, like, OK, why? And somebody replied and said, well, there were two teams with two separate budgets that both wanted to get OpenStack and didn't agree with each other. I'm like, yep, that's probably why. So like, this is the, the kind of stuff where you're not necessarily going to design the ideal system if you're trying to map it perfectly onto your org chart. But you also aren't going to be able to, um, say, have one team working on your backend APIs and another team working on your mobile apps and have them never talk to each other ever because realistically, someday you're going to want to deprecate v1 of the API. Or like, there's going to be endpoints that you have to make breaking changes to for reasons. And, like Having the ability to talk to each other about that stuff and again, the team doesn't have to be co-located to do that, but they do have to have enough trust and communication between the teams to do that. I think it's, it's really important. Um, okay, so like on the topic of tools, it's like, okay, so 
we're all here because we want to talk about computers and not people or whatever, and that's cool, but like, I think tools are an important part of making distributed teams work, um, but I don't think that they're in any way the only thing that you would use to make distributed teams work. So like, for example, uh, I think like, just for an example at Pivotal, we, this is an example of some of the tools we use for synchronous communication. I do literally end up DMing some of my coworkers on Twitter more than I end up talking to them on Slack, depending on the coworker. Um, you know, Slack, shared Google Docs, uh, you know, Hangouts, you know, messages, whatever. Um, that's kind of one of those things where like some people in the org are not going to be using Slack for whatever reason. And so then you just end up talking to them on Google Chat and wishing that they were on Slack. Like, those are the kind of things that are not necessarily perfect. I've, in past versions of this talk, I had a haiku about Slack because it was so great when I was at an org where literally everyone used it. And like now, well, you know what? Not everyone does. That's just something we have to deal with. Um, something which is kind of interesting is thinking about these for, uh, when you think about asynchronous communication, for us, a lot of the tools remain the same because you don't actually have to all be there at the same time to have conversations on Twitter or Slack or collaborate on a Google Doc. Uh, and we also end up using, obviously, like GitHub and Tracker and Trello. And um, there is this thing called social chat, which for some reason the field really likes. So I don't know. I look at it sometimes. Mostly I just filter the emails from it. Um, OK, so one, one thing, I, I, you've been hearing me say, like, you know, distributed, everybody far away from each other, it's great. You spend time with your cats at home. Like, this is all very true. I do think that when you're new starting a job or if you're hiring uh, remote people for your teams, I think onboarding on person, in person is really valuable. And it doesn't mean that, especially if you don't have a central location for your team, it doesn't mean that the onboarding has to happen at an office somewhere. But I do think some in-person face-to-face with an existing member of the team is a really good way to have this super fast, super uh, high bandwidth, intense kind of, you know, dump all of the info into their brain that you want to get started. So I do think that that's one place where the in-person is really essential. If you're, if, if you're going to take a remote job someplace and they're like, we emailed you, or no, we snail mailed you a laptop, you know, here's some uh, one-time password stuff with credentials, and you're like, that's super, I guess I'm logging in on my first day. Don't do that, that's just, we are human beings. We do like to see other human beings from time to time. So don't do that. Um, and uh, I think there's, there's also a lot of assumptions around how people are gonna interact. This is, this is by the way, from uh, Kyle Kingsbury's excellent Jepson project that you should totally go you know, read all of the stuff about it's for testing failure in distributed systems. It's very interesting. Um, but uh, it's, it's named for this uh, Carly Rae Jepsen song, you know, Call Me Maybe. And the, the plot of the song, I'll give you a, a slight spoiler here, is that they have uh, vastly different assumptions around, you know, these people's interactions with each other. One person is thinking one thing, another person's thinking something completely different. Everything gets revealed at the end of the song. And I think that when we're... When we're uh, interacting with people that we don't necessarily see in person all the time, we have to rethink some of those basic, well, of course, fill in the blank. It's like, maybe not, maybe not of course. So like, for example, um, we had, uh, at my last gig, um, I was working at Drama Fever. It's a streaming video site that was a lot like Netflix, if Netflix were much smaller and mostly Korean soap opera. Um, <laughs> and, and ran Docker in production since October 2013. Oh yes, and uh, you know, cutting edge, bleeding edge. There was there was lots of blood, um, but uh, we had our employee handbook in GitHub, you know, as one does. And one of our developers actually went in and edited some not intended to be harmful, just it, kind of funny stuff, you know. See when your coworkers will be letting you down. Let them know when you'll be repaying the favor. It's, it's funny, but it's depending on the cultural context of the person reading it or how guilty they feel about having to take some vacation time. That's not necessarily the language that's going to make them feel comfortable about taking their vacation time. And so this fellow Patty went and changed it to like, know when your coworkers aren't supposed to be working so you can encourage them to t stop replying to you on Slack. That's kind of paying attention to those, um, those barriers. Like when you're, if we, our coworker Casey calls it instead of work-life balance, he calls it work-life blending. But like the idea that if you're on a distributed team, does that mean you're always working all the time? 
Joe's just sitting there looking at me like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. But you're you're probably not, right? Like you are gonna spend some time with family or friends or whatever. Um, And having it be perfectly fine for somebody to, you know, set those boundaries and say, this is when I'm not working. Even if other people on the team maybe still are working because time zones, right? And another, another thing that I think is really important, this is an example from my last job, where I had, um, I had commented on a, like a GitHub issue, and my boss had replied with something like, well, while you're in there, do something else. And I remember being really upset about it because it sounded like he was saying I was wasting my time doing something that I thought was important. And so I stewed about it, and I was kind of upset, and then I just asked him, like, did you say this because you really thought what I was working on there was unimportant? He didn't mean it that way at all. Like, I just assumed that. So I think having that conversation, even if it feels awkward and uncomfortable, because what if he had said, yeah, I really thought the thing you were working on there didn't matter, sorry. Like, that, that would have been kind of a not great thing to have to hear, but it also, at least I wouldn't have been sitting there wondering, you know? So even if it feels awkward and weird, I think it's valuable to at least over-communicate a little. And I also think especially, and again, I'm like doing tech advocacy now, but I was, my last job was a year um, doing ops remotely. We were five people on the ops team and none of us were geographically co-located. And so every time we were, you know, poking at production in some, some sort of un- unexpected way or whatever, um, we would definitely be explicit about what we were doing, what we were working on. Uh, we ended up putting, we were 100% in AWS, and we ended up um, just like, we looked at CloudFormation and Terraform and at the time in early 2014, they were both still a little bit too green. I think Charity would probably say Terraform is still too green, but um, we ended up just uh, dumping the, um, the JSON for all of our AWS configs, um, for all of our CloudWatch, et cetera, you know, uh, auto-scaling groups, everything, and then throwing that in GitHub so that if there was something that we expected our infrastructure to be a certain way and we needed to change it, then we had a Jenkins job that I set up that would break the build for you know, our infrastructure if something was changed that wasn't checked in. So that way we could at least see if things were changing out from under us in an unexpected way. Um, and I think that like having, instead of having the well, the assumption is probably everything's fine unless we have happened to have set up an alert that will tell us. Yeah, I mean, you know that that's not safe, right? So, like, just being explicit about what you're working on, what you're doing, what you're changing, and asking for help if you think you need it. You know, getting, getting a couple of sets of eyes on any kind of ops or other stuff is pretty important. And I also, like, this meme was going around last year, and uh, if you can't read it from the back, it just says, like, you know, 1995, we were all going to just do everything from anywhere, and 2015, must be willing to relocate to San Francisco. I'm like, okay, just show of hands, who here has actually relocated to San Francisco? I see maybe four hands, so yeah, no. Um, it's not really something that you really want to do for every single job ever. And some of us, like, a couple of years ago, we were having a polar vortex of like extreme cold in Minnesota, and I got an email from a Google recruiter asking me if I wanted to come interview in California, because I see you're in Minnesota, and it's very cold there right now. And I just wrote back with one line, snow is a feature, not a bug. Like, this is, like, not, if I had wanted to move to San Francisco, like, I'm old enough, I probably would have done it during the first dot-com boom. So it's like, no, probably not. And I think that there is sometimes this idea that you absolutely have to in order to get something done, even if, perhaps if the something is like a really small startup you're trying to get off the ground or whatever. And I do think that being in a room with your teammates can lead to a lot of fast iteration, but there's plenty of coding and contemplation that you don't have to do in direct proximity with each other. So I disagree with the, you must be 100% co-located for you know, some particular kinds of work. Um, I also think that this idea, like, that our industries are all, you know, I talk to, um, in, in my role uh, as working at a vendor now, I talk to a lot of people from a lot of large enterprises that are possibly rightfully concerned about everything changing in the industry. But I also think that it's not entirely surprising. I mean, the world keeps changing. If we just expect the cycle of change to, like, continue, then, you know, let's just assume things will keep changing. Okay check later, we were right. So the idea that um, people are going to, in order to get 
their goals met, that they need to follow whatever the tech trend at this very moment is. And so, you know, for a while it was like, let's outsource everything. And then it was like, oh no, we have to bring everything back in house. And then it was like, we should build everything ourselves from scratch. And it's like, no, no, we should use public cloud for everything. It's like, there's an awful lot, as Schaefer likes to say, there's an awful lot of tribalism in fashion and tech. We don't necessarily have to follow it all. Um, but he's also right when he says that there is not actually a talent shortage. Like, there is a shortage of people who, there might be a shortage of people who already have a ton of experience in the thing that you want and live where you want them to live and will accept the pay that you want them to accept and want to work with you. Like, there might be a shortage of that, but that doesn't mean that there's an overall talent shortage. And so people who are trying to, you know, hire, which it seems like every conference I go to, every talk I go to, like people are talking about how they're hiring. We're hiring too, by the way, pivotal.io slash careers. Um, but if everybody is hiring, yet saying it's hard to find the people who are right, like maybe you have to reevaluate who, who are the people who are right? Which factors can you change? Maybe you don't want to change the factors about them being people you would actually want to work with, but perhaps you want to hire more junior devs and you know train them. Or perhaps you want to hire people who are absolutely perfect in every way, but live in Montana and have no desire to move. Because like, I have news for you, they have internet in Montana now. Like It's probably fine. Um, and there's also a lot of benefit to the flexibility that having a distributed team, or at least partially distributed team, um, brings to an organization, uh, even for people who often go into the office. And this was from a couple of jobs ago, and it was just one particular day that, I don't even think it was raining a lot that day. I don't know, maybe it was beautiful out, but like, it seemed like everybody was working from home that day. I was working remote, so I was like working from home like every day. But the people who were um, working out of an office, a lot of them needed to not be in the office that day, and it wasn't actually a problem because anything that they needed was going to happen online anyway. And so like, even for the people who want to go into an office every day, you know, being a little bit more remote friendly is a huge win in terms of giving them the flexibility that they need to live, you know, their normal human lives. There was a Martin Fowler blog post that had some really interesting points about remote versus co-located work. And there's a lot of stuff in there about how you build your teams and et cetera. But like the, the one thing I just want to focus on is this idea from um, this image of like, you can, a, a team might move faster. It might be really fast, all co-located together. But at that point, you can only hire the people who want to be co-located in that place. And so if you want your best selection of people, co-located or not, then probably the way you're going to achieve that is getting all the people that you can from anywhere, wherever it is that they you know, happen to live. And like they can, if you have all of the best people, however you want to try to define best, then like if you change that, must relocate to San Francisco meme, you know, flip that on its head, you give yourself a lot more hiring options, which can, it's no guarantee of being more effective, but it can certainly give you a lot more choices. Um, there's also something else about microservices that I probably should point out, which is when you're working on a giant monolithic system, like maybe you feel attached to your little piece. When you're working on a service that's just you and like the four people that you spend all your time on, you know, your own Slack channel with, you're going to probably get really attached to it. And you're also going to have a lot of, you know, interactions you have to manage, whether it be via your, you know, with your, via your APIs, with your contracts, um, whatever those, however you're going to set up your contracts and promises, your platform, your interactions with the rest of the distributed system that your microservice is a small part of, uh, you have to negotiate all of that. And, you're not going to negotiate, you're not going to be able to negotiate all of it by API calls. Like, that's just not realistic. Because can you imagine, like, having already thought of all of the things you're going to want to argue about? I mean, I haven't ever had that happen in the workplace. So I think that that's, that's like, probably one of the things to watch out for when you go for the explosion of microservices to the point where, I don't know, Matt Rainey from Uber claims that they're not sure how many GitHub repos they have. I've had other people tell me, no, we know how many, but um, 
when you are going to, you know, an explosion of microservices, I think it is important to think about that. Like, how are all these pieces going to interact? And if you're not going to be able to negotiate between all the people, what are your um, contractual, uh, you know, commitments in terms of how these services are going to talk to each other so that you don't end up with horrible, horrible problems? Like, ProTip will give you one for free. Definitely don't share your uh, data store between microservices because we've totally made, uh, my last job, we totally made that mistake. And in one particular case, it proved to be a huge pain, right? Because it's like, oh, yeah, we totally have all these changes we need to make to the database. But we can't make those changes to the database because that will affect this other microservice. And it's like, oh, OK. So you're not really doing microservices, are you? Nope. So in that particular case. Um, Let's see. Oh, yeah. So something else that I think, thinking about all of this, you know, weighty stuff to think about and advice. Like, I think most of us probably have a, you know, have a reasonably well-developed Jiminy Cricket like conscience ourselves. What do we think is actually the right way to interact with other people? Like, just because we're going to be on a distributed team where those people are mostly tiny icons, I actually end up leaving Slack expanded um, so that you can see the little face icons a lot of the time, just because otherwise I get kind of lonely. Compact view makes me lonely. But, um, but the, uh, the part where you should treat other people right, that we probably, since we're all adults walking around in a conference center and not like completely feral, we probably all learned at some point, you know, how to interact in kindergarten. And that's, that's kind of, by the way, how I feel a, you know, a certificate of DevOps or whatever would be. It's like, congratulations, you learned not to hit the other children and not to eat crayons. Like, good job. Um, is like, you know how you want to be treated. You know how to treat other people. Like, even if the other people are on that other team that built that one particular service that really should be three services, and that the health check is always like reporting that things are broken and throwing things out of the load balancer when they're not actually broken, and everybody isn't mad and everything's on fire, like even when you're dealing with stuff like that, like remembering that these people probably didn't go to work intending to do a bad job, like they probably tried to do their best, and figuring out. Um, there was a, you know, just, we've been hearing in other talks uh, earlier, like about, you know, things like blamelessness. Like, uh, Camille was talking about learning reviews. Figuring out where somebody went wrong. Uh, what was it? The, why on earth did someone give Bridget root anyway? Exactly. Like, figuring out um, why something happens so that you can have it not happen again is a lot more valuable than being mad at that other team, which is a pretty typical and inevitable consequence of like breaking yourself into a whole bunch of little teams working on separate services. Um, that's pretty much all I have to talk about. Like, I think that there's a ton of info there, and there's a there's a ton of stuff we could discuss. Um, we, I think I have probably enough time for a few questions, but I would also be equally happy to just talk to you on Twitter or over at the reception. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much uh, my talk, so thank you. Sure. Oh. Okay, so uh, all right, so here we have the talks. Recla oh, oh. Mm -hmm. The questions just say, will there be drinks at this reception? Uh, so here's a good question, actually. Uh, how do you build a shared understanding about a product in a distributed team? Yeah, um, I think shared understanding about a product is a tricky one, especially because you may have fundamental disagreements uh, just from the outside about what the product should be or should do. And I think it really does help to have product direction coming from uh, people who communicate with each other a lot. So they may not be co-located, but the product manager or managers for the team need to definitely be having, you know, probably uh, video conferencing meetings quite a bit, and then also have a, at least, you know, some amount of notes from those meetings that other people can read. So that, especially because later, when some naysayer says, well, I just don't understand. I thought we were building X. You can at least look back and say, well, in April, 
That's definitely what the notes said. This is where we diverge from that. Oh dear, we should have been paying attention. So yeah, I think the, the constant syncing with each other is really a really helpful, useful way to keep that from being a horrible disaster. There was another sort of lower level question, which was, how do you know when people are awake? That is a wonderful question, actually. Um, in terms of knowing whether people are awake or not, uh, I don't know about you, but I leave my Slack uh, setting set to away on almost all my Slack teams a lot, because otherwise, depending on the Slack team, like the, the DevOps Days Organizer Slack team, for example, has people all around the globe, and if I open my laptop because I need to get something really brief done at you know 6 a.m., but then I plan to go back to sleep, I don't really want to get drawn into a long conversation. So like, I kind of, you know, don't, I leave that flag as like not available. But I would say like, uh, my work one on the other hand, I never turn that one off. So if my laptop is open, like my work one will be green. Um, I think that if you're not using Slack, I'm, you should be using Slack, but if you're not using Slack, uh, if you have any kind of presence indicator, that especially, I think it's really nice if it's manually toggleable. Also, I don't know if HipChat still has this, but at one point, there said if you were on a laptop or mobile, and I actually don't really like that, because it shouldn't make a difference. And so I don't want people to be like, I wonder why that person's on mobile right now. So I think that there's, presence indicators are probably a good way to deal with that. Also, if you just have a, Slack did add that stuff where um, you, can set your your, you can set your awake hours in there so that you, if you have your notifications set so that you're gonna be notified when you get messages, um, like push notifications, uh, you can have your sleep hours set so that you don't get messages during that. That way your coworkers don't have to feel bad about at mentioning you or messaging you while you're sleeping. Because like, if you are sleeping, it's not gonna wake you up. Cool, okay, I know we're standing between you and meeting a robot, I believe, and Ooh. alcohol. Um, so I uh, just want to say thank you very, uh, very much to Bridget once again. Um, so yeah, round of applause. Thank you.